Okay, great. Um, we'll get started. So, hi everyone, I'm Jason, and uh, thanks all for coming to what I'm pretty sure is the last workshop uh, for ACMI of this school year, uh, and might also be the last Zoom workshop that we host. Hopefully we can offer in-person workshops in the fall. Um, so this workshop is about, uh, is an intro to explainability in computer vision. Um, the, the official title is slightly misleading. I said explainable computer vision. Um, that's certainly um, one kind of um, uh, topic in explainability in computer vision. Uh, and we'll make the distinction um, in this workshop so that you're aware. But more generally, the workshop is about different techniques used to sort of explain how image classification models arrive at their predictions. So there are a couple of assumptions. Um, so uh, some of the material that we'll cover do require a bit of calculus knowledge. Um, but um, for those who are um, maybe more interested about the programming part, um, I'll mostly focus on the intuition. Um, but if you're also interested in more of like the theoretical reasoning behind some of these methods, um, I've also included some resources and as well as a bit of the math derivation for you to look at after the workshop is over. Um, so really there's only just basic calculus, like knowing what a derivative and an integral is, um, linear algebra, knowing what a matrix is, um, basic programming. And if you know Python and TensorFlow, then that definitely is a plus, but it's not really required. Um, we'll basically be going over everything you need to know. So it's very self-contained. Uh, and so again, um, we will have a live coding component. Uh, so you can follow along if you want, excuse me. Um, or if you just prefer to watch me code and if you find that relaxing, then you know you can do that as well. But um, basically, we'll, I'll, I will be using Colab. Um, and I recommend you also use Colab just for consistency. But you're welcome to use any coding environment that you want, as long as it has TensorFlow, NumPy, and Matplotlib. OK. Uh, so we'll start with a bit of the why, why this whole area matters. Um, uh, I assume that if you're here, you're either curious or you kind of already know a bit of why it's important. Um, but basically, um, in image classification, uh, we have these tools called neural networks that have emerged that perform really, really well. Um, like they can achieve superhuman performance on certain benchmarks that we've designed. Um, and that seems very impressive. On the other hand, though, um, our models of neural networks are extremely, extremely complex, right? So for example, here we have the stop sign and it goes through this neural network. And we might get a correct answer, which is great, right? Or we might get an incorrect answer, uh, which might be concerning, right? Um, but in either case, it would be really helpful to understand why the neural network thought it was a stop sign and got it correct, or thought it was a pedestrian and got it incorrect, right? It would be nice to have some kind of explanation from the neural network, right? And obviously, <laughs> we can't just straight up ask the neural network, like, hey, why did you do that, right? We're at least not there yet. Maybe in the future there will be NLP solutions to that. Um, but right now, um, you know, NLP, um, sorry, uh, neural networks sort of speak a certain language, right? That is very different from what humans are used to. Um, and so from our perspective, it can be a bit of a black box, right? And this, of course, raises a lot of trustworthiness concerns um, over the transparency of these models, right? Uh, especially if you're being driven in an autonomous vehicle and uh, you're uh, the thing that's actually driving you is uh, something that I can't really easily explain why it's making its driving decisions. Um, you might have some questions about getting in that kind of vehicle um, or having your grandma get in that kind of vehicle. So we would like to have some kind of assurance that uh, you know these models are, are doing the right thing. And so this is sort of where explainability comes in. 
And I'm going to give you a very brief overview because this is sort of, there's a lot of different approaches here. Um, but the two main ones are, one, there are models that are inherently interpretable, right? So they're very, so they're explainable by design. Um, and when I say interpretable, I'm going to use that term interchangeably with explainable. They basically just mean the same thing. So one example of such a model is a decision tree, right? And so basically at each node, we just make a decision, either yes or no, and then we go down to a different branch. So, And the reason why it's inherently interpretable is because your explanation is literally just the path that it traces out in this tree. And so you can just directly look at the model and we know that whatever explanation we see is 100% faithful to what the model is actually processing, right? How it's actually doing things. A more mathematical um, interval model arguably could be linear regression, right? Um, for example, um, you can have maybe a feature vector called X that contains a bunch of different features, maybe age and weight and so on and so forth. And your explanation could just be the weights given to each feature, right? So maybe age is like 10 times more important than um, you know, your height for some kind of linear regression decision. And there are, of course, many other more um, interpretable models. And some get more complex. Some build on top of these concepts. Um, one such example is called a self-explaining neural network which is basically like linear regression, but you replace each con uh, coefficient with like a neural network. And you also replace each uh, feature um, vector component with like another neural network. But the overall structure is very similar to linear regression. So there's other solutions out there. Um, and there's similar analogs for decision trees and such. Um, and if you're interested in any of those, um, feel free to ask me and I can share you some resources on those latest works. Um, but the focus of today's workshop is on this sort of second branch of models, right? So the downside of the first side is that if you've already trained, you know, a big model to accomplish some classification task, um, then you probably spent a lot of time really fine tuning the architecture. And it might be really expensive to move over to an entirely different architecture, right? Um, because to get explainability using the first approach, you basically have to redo your entire architecture to fit into one of these you know, other solutions. And so that's where the second branch of explainability approaches comes in. Uh, and it's basically, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a one specific term for it, but for me, I just call it post hoc analysis. And the idea is that we have a, in contrast to our first approach, we have a model that's not inherently interpretable. So like a neural network, which is very, very complicated to interpret correctly. Um, and um, basically what we do in post hoc analysis is we say, after the model has made its decision or its prediction, in this case, seeing, thinking that it, um, you know, there are lines in this image, uh, then we go back and say, okay, let's try to reconstruct why you thought it was what you thought, right? And out of that reconstruction, out of that post hoc analysis, we might get something called a saliency map. And what a saliency map is, is basically an image that highlights regions of the input image that were important to the model when it made its decision, right? So down here you see um, red means very important and blue means not important. So the red regions correspond to roughly the faces of the lines in this case. And you could think of that as sort of explaining why the model outputted lines as its prediction result. Uh, and so this just means that we're focusing on this uh, second branch. So any, any questions so far on this overview? Great. Um, so here's like a very short video, very short conversation. Um, actually, I'm not sure. Oh, shoot, I see the chat. 
will the slides be uploaded somewhere later today? Yeah, I will probably share these slides right after the um, right after workshop. Uh, is there a check-in code? Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't set up one, um, but um, I can probably talk to the rest of the board and we can see if we can get one. Um, yeah, maybe after the fact. <laughs> and then if you if you want, I could probably send it to you after. Sorry about that. Um, but anyways, so here's a brief conversation between Jeff Hinton and one of his colleagues, um, sort of on this topic of explainability. And just as a preface, um, they're trying, Jeff Hinton is sort of trying to argue actually a different perspective on this issue, which is his response to neural networks are non-transparent. Um, and so I'll just, Wait, let me share, make sure my, um, um, I'm sharing my audio, share computer sound. Um, okay. You're an expert, mm -hmm. right? You can recognize that digit. Yeah. What is it? Do y'all hear this or no? It's a thumb. So why is it? It is a thumb. Now if I say why? Because it looks okay, roughly how I would draw it. That's not really an explanation, is it? <laughs> explain to me, what is it about this that makes it a two? Well, it obviously gets harder to explain. Okay, but what's it's interesting is, yeah. if you push people, they will start telling you what it is about this that makes a two. Mm. And I can show you twos that have none of the characteristics you'll say makes this a two. Right. So the point is, on normal, everyday discrimination that you're an expert at, mm -hmm. you make the discrimination well, and if pushed, you will make up a story about how you did it. And there's no difference between you and a radiologist. If pushed, they will make up a story about how they did it. But that's not how they did it. And so we already have systems that we're using that can't explain how they actually made the decision. They can cook up a story um, that's a story that other radiologists may agree with. But it's not how they actually make the decision. That's not how their perceptual systems do it. And all we're doing is saying, let's replace those with neural networks. Now, with neural networks, we can also do the same. We can get the neural networks to cook up a story. So you can get the neural network, you could train the neural network to come up with explanations and agree with other neural networks, mm -hmm. and the explanations don't have to be how it actually did it. So people are incredibly good at rationalizing. Mm -hmm. They will make up an explanation for anything. Mm -hmm. And, and the, fa the fact that four out of five people might agree that's a two, no, everybody will agree. If, right. if they have to decide between <laughs> the 10 digits, I'm an expert on digits. Okay. So I know more about digits than anybody else in this world. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to, to make the case for potential inter-observer variability. Okay, right. the fact that everybody agrees that's a two doesn't provide you any insight into why it's a two. Right. And so the reality is when you get, if that were something complex like diabetic retinopathy at a particular grade, the fact that most people, but not all people, would agree on it who are experts, they still can't tell you why it is what it is. In most cases, they'll have, as Jeff says, a rationalization. Here are some of the things that make it a two. Or point a two. to their degrees on the wall. Oh, well, or they may point to some list of criteria. Yeah. But when they look at it, it's a, it's a judgment. Right. And, and after a while, they'll tend to converge with each other, but only to a certain degree. So. It's, it makes much more sense to say, instead of get, getting all fussed about the non-transparency, to simply say, are the judgments more consistent? Mm -hmm. are they, can they be refined to be more inclusive of a range of possibilities? And the answer is with deep learning, that's possible. Great. So, yeah, so that's their perspective on this sort of issue of non-transparency in neural networks. Um, and, um, I mean, obviously, given that Jeff Hinton was the inventor of neural networks, of course, he would be very, um, defensive about his, his, um, invention. But I think, of course, um, you know, there's many different perspectives on this. Um, wait, not later again. Um, but, you know, it turns out that, the, I mean, their points are definitely valid and it is right to be concerned about whether your explanation is actually explaining what is going on in the model versus just 
making up the story that seems very convincing that your model is actually knows what it's doing, right? And um, there's been papers that kind of explored this model, sorry, explored this question. And if you're interested in those types of questions, we did a reading group session in February on this paper called Standing Deep Checks for Resiliency Maps. And you can just search it on YouTube. That actually ends up being the first result. Um, and there's also a follow-up paper um, actually sort of criticizing this original paper um, called Sanity Checks for Saliency Metrics. So it's not like we're doing sanity checks on those sanity checks. Uh, and they actually found out that some of the arguments they made in the original paper are, you know, maybe require a little bit more analysis. So um, yeah, again, if you're interested in this sort of area, you can look into these papers. Right. And the other main point is that uh, explanations are highly subjective, right? And this sort of parallels, like, you know, how we experience things in the real world, right? An explanation from a teacher for you might be good enough, but for one of your peers, uh, they might require things to be broken down a little more, or maybe they like to think things in terms of higher level, you know, abstractions or examples. Um, really, there's no like one size fits all objective, you know, this is a good explanation, right? Because how do you even define what a good explanation is, right? We can start to form criteria and we can try to make sure that our uh, interpretability methods follow those criteria. But at the end of the day, it's going to have some variation in what people um, accept as a good explanation. So that's just kind of like an asterisk on, on all this. Um, it's, there is some hand wavingness to this, even though there's, you know, there can be a lot of math, um, but at the end of the day, a good explanation is sort of up to you. So um, here's where we start to move into the coding portion. Um, so um, just as a primer, um, we mentioned saliency maps before, and that's basically what we'll be uh, actually implementing today. Um, so I have some notation um, just so that we're on the same page when I excuse me, uh, when I refer to certain symbols on the next few slides. Um, is there an event code we can get for points? Yes, yeah, sorry. So currently uh, I haven't set up the uh, event code, uh, but I can try to talk to the board and see if we can get an event code. Um, so if you came, then just DM me and um, I could probably share the code with you after the fact. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I um, didn't really have time to set up the code. Um, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, that'd be really helpful. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, so um, this is just some like notation preliminaries. So, um, so uh, we can represent the output of our neural network by f of x, and it's important to note that f of x is the unnormalized logits from the neural network. So we're not looking at what's out coming out of the softmax layer, right? That's normalized. We're looking at what goes into the softmax layer. So these are the logits um, that are, you know, not between zero and one, but they can be like, you know, 700 or like, you know, crazy values. Um, and there's specific reasons why we, we do that instead of softmax, um, but those are kind of nuances that you can look further into in, in certain papers. Um, and um, additionally, we can talk about, so if you look at the logits, this is actually a vector, right? It's a vector and the, with the number of dimension, dimensions uh, as the number of classes that you're trying to predict over, right? And so when you talk about a saliency map, you want to explain, uh, you want to offer an explanation for a particular class, right? Specifically, we want to ask, hey, your network, why did you assign this particular score to this particular class, right? And so for that, we kind of denote uh, using the subscript C for some class C. Um, and, you know, uh, we denote a specific image as just X naught. X is sort of just a variable for any kind of um, image. Um, and typically in practice, C is the predicted class. So, oh great, thanks. So yeah, the checking code is in the chat, everyone, if you are interested in, in taking that. Um, uh, 
But as I was saying, so yeah, C is typically to predict the class because usually we're interested only in the class that the model thinks is most likely, right? Um, but in theory, we could take the saliency map with respect to any of the classes if we want. We could find explanations for you know any of the decisions that it really makes, right? But the one decision that we're usually concerned about is the one that the um, neural network thinks is the highest probability class. Um, and so because of that, we actually, I'm just going to drop the C in the next few slides. Just know that there's an implicit subscript C there. Um, but when it's missing, I implicitly mean we assume the predicted class is, is being talked about. Um, and uh, I just know I of X as an interpretability map function that produces the saliency map. Right. Um, and of course, this depends on the model, right? Um, so. Uh, each model is going to offer a different explanation, but obviously, um, you know, I, I just omit the model dependence and the parameters here. So just I of X. Okay. So we're going to look at and actually implement two different kinds of um, these post hoc saliency, meth um, saliency methods. And the first one is actually like really easy to implement. Like, you're going to see like it's super, super straightforward to implement, especially in TensorFlow. Um, and so basically, this method is called um, the vanilla gradient method. Um, what is the code? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, so this method is called vanilla gradient. And as the name implies, the method is literally just taking the gradients of your um, the logic uh, for the class you're interested in with respect to your input image. Um, there's a question, where do I find this? Um, what do you mean by this, the code or? Oh, yeah, the code. Um, the code's in the chat. Do you need to see it again or where to input? Oh, I think you mean the actual like, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so we're going to get to implementing the code uh, like right after this. Um, but I'm still setting up some preliminaries here. Um, but um, you can already go ahead and like set up Google Colab if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, so um, anyways, yeah, so vanilla gradient is taking the gradient of your logic with respect to your input image. And what you'll get is something that is the same dimension as your input image, where each value um, corresponds to um, sort of like the sensitivity of your logic with respect to that input pixel position. right? So basically, a higher uh, derivative at that dimension is going to be like, uh, a very small nudge in that pixel's value is going to change the logic value like a lot, right? And this can either be positive or negative, implying either an increase or a decrease in your logic. So it can actually positively or negatively affect um, your classification score, right? Um, and for the paper, you can sort of see um, this is the paper that introduced it actually a while ago in 2014, and um, if you want to look at the details, it's in section three, right? This is the vanilla gradient right here. And, um, and it's an example of what you would expect. You would expect something like this. Um, note that there's only like two different colors here, like black or white and different shades in between. Um, this is actually using the absolute value of the vanilla gradient. But for us, we're gonna actually visualize both. Um, so we're just gonna visualize positive and negative. Uh, so yeah, this is the part where we actually implement the code. So I will paste this link in the chat. And I will show you what to do as well here. So if you open that link, what we're going to do is we're going to create a copy of this notebook. So all this notebook does is it just provides a model that we can use and actually um, interpret. So I'm going to click Run in Google Collab. And so this creates 
or it just opens the notebook. Um, but if I actually want to save basically everything that I alter here, I'm going to need to create a copy. So I'm going to go to file and then save a copy and drive. And um, by the way, make sure you're signed in. And then I'll say open a new tab. And this is my copy, right? So I'm going to rename this um, explain ability dot there. Okay. Um, and so once you get to that point, um, again, like all this code is doing is just, just setting up a model that we can use pretty quickly. So we can just go to runtime and just run all. And it should set up a model for you. Um, the thing is, so it really doesn't matter what kind of model we use here. We just use like what a single, a single fully connected layer and then like some dropout and uh, sorry, there's two fully connected layers. Um, but really you can have like convolutional layers and you know max pooling and basically as long as your model is differentiable, then you could do vanilla gradient on it. Right. So um, yeah, make sure your model trains and then that accuracy is very good, 97%. And from now on, we could just directly use model now it's trained. Right? So I'm just going to add a new code section down here for us to start implementing vanilla gradient. Okay. Um, so at this point, you can just follow along or, or listen, whatever floats your boat. Right? Um, so uh, we're going to import two packages. One is NumPy, which is just going to let us do operations on matrices. And the other is matplotlib, which is actually going to allow us to um, visualize some of these uh, salience maps. Right? So matplotlib.pyplot. OK. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Python function that's going to take in some image, a NumPy image and basically return um, the vanilla gradient saliency map for me. Um, and we'll actually allow the input image to either be a batch of images. Actually, yeah, just, just in general, a batch of images. So I'm going to say, uh, let's see, get VG maps. I'll take in some images. Right. Um, and so basically, our goal is to take the gradients of the output logic that we're interested in for a predict class with respect to the input image. So in TensorFlow, to actually take your gradient, um, at least in TensorFlow 2, when you have something called eager execution, which is not really too important, um, but you could do something like uh, with tf.gradient.tape as tape. And then this creates a new scope where basically all operations here can now be basically tracked for computing the gradient. And so um, the first thing we'll do is we'll convert our images into, um, so we mentioned, let me just add for clarity. Uh, so images is a NumPy array, right, of images. Right, and our goal is to return VG maps for some images. Right, so uh, in TensorFlow, if you want to do operations on something, then especially if you want to take the gradient, uh, we have to make sure it's a TensorFlow tensor and not a NumPy array. Um, if you're not too familiar with the distinction, um, don't worry. Um, just make sure that you have tf.constant around images. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to actually watch, um, we're going to have our gradient tape watch this images. So just actually make sure that um, whatever we do on the images, whatever operations we do, is going to get tracked by our gradient tape, which means when we when it comes time to actually ask you know, TensorFlow, hey, can you compute the gradient of this? Uh, it's going to go back to the tape and look at what it was tracking and then make its computations there. All right, so now we're tracking it. Uh, let's get our logits. Right, so let's actually perform some operations on our images. So we're just going to pass images into model, and this will give us sort of a tensor of size, you know, your batch size times 10, right? Because we have 10 classes. Um, 
So, of course, we're interested for our purposes in just the predicted class, right, which is just sort of the maximum score. So I'm going to create a new variable called um, pred, which basically just is the argmax of the logits over the last dimension, which is your, the first dimension is your batch. The second dimension, there's only two dimensions. The second dimension is your, your logits. Okay. And finally, um, I'm going to say that F uh, is going to be, um, basically we have our logits and we want to sort of index into it using pred, which is our argmax. Right, so for example, if pred returns like seven for some image, that means the model thinks it's a seven. And so we want to index into basically the seventh value in the logits, right? So we can do that using tf.gather, which is basically like indexing. Um, first one is our array and second one is our in indices. And uh, I'm also going to add batch to equals one because we're allowing for a batch of images. Right. And um, last thing is just we actually need to compute the gradient. And so here is where it's basically super easy in TensorFlow. What we're going to return is we're going to refer to our tape and we're asked it to compute a gradient. Um, and basically, this is dy dx, right? First argument is y, so in our case, it's f. And second is we want to take the gradient with respect to images. And actually, that's pretty much it. Right, this gives you the vanilla gradient app. Okay. And so what we can do is we can say, uh, let me say VG maps equals get VG maps. And then for images, um, the notebook actually already loads in MNIST. So we can just say from X test, um, which uh, let's check out the shape here. Yeah, so we have 10,000 images and they're each 28 by 28. So since this expects a batch of images, we'll do like X test, maybe like the first five uh, images is not defined. Oh, I see. Uh, images. Cool. And so let's see. As we would expect, we get five vanilla gradient maps, each with the same dimensions as the input image. And so let's actually visualize some of these maps. So to visualize something, we will use pyplot. So we'll say plot.imshow to show an image, and then we'll just pass in our image. And in this case, um, let's first visualize the original image. So X test, we'll say first one. And the color map is just gonna be gray. We'll visualize this in grayscale. And so the first image is E7. Now let's view the corresponding vanilla gradient map. And we'll pass that to PyPlot, I am the show. And so here uh, we could do gray, and that's what we saw in the paper. Um, but again, when you take a gradient, it could either be positive or negative. So we're going to do both. And we're just going to use the blue, white, and red uh, color map. So blue corresponds to negative and red corresponds to positive and white is just neutral or zero. Right. Uh, and so this is your vanilla green map. Um, and maybe you can see <laughs> roughly a seven here, but again, this is why, you know, explanations are highly subjective, right? Um, and actually, if you wanted to overlay uh, your vanilla gradient on top of your original image, you can stack these together and then just pass this parameter called alpha so that there's some transparency in between. And then you can kind of overlay them on, on top of each other. Right. Um, and so you can do this for like different images, right? So you could do it for a second image and you know, get the corresponding vanilla gray map and maybe you could sort of see a two here. I don't know, it's kind of subjective. Um, and so you, know, you can overlay on top and you know, you make what you will of it. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can play around with that, but now you have a function that implemented uh, vanilla gradient method. And this is super easy because like TensorFlow um, has a feature called uh, auto diff, 
or auto differentiation, uh, which basically is going to compute all those complicated gradients for you, right? All the chain rules and stuff. So you don't need to worry about that, right? So super handy if you want to implement this yourself. That's great. Um, so any questions at this point um, or anyone wants me to go over a portion of the code or anything? Cool. Was anyone able to actually implement? Um, oh, shoot, my speaker was off. Sorry if I didn't hear anyone. Uh, okay, I think everything's okay. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so that's vanilla gradient. Um, and basically, we will march right on to our second interoperability method. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> you might have gotten a heart attack with me to get to this slide. Um, but um, I trust you, it's not bad, and we'll focus more on the intuition instead of math. But of course, if you're interested in math, then you know I included it here, and you can go back and, and look at this, or you can also look at the paper um, to make sense of it after the workshop. Um, but basically, um, you know, one might think, well, we have vanilla gradient. We're done, right? We're done. <laughs> we solved explainability. You know, we understand everything about neural networks. You know, there's there's no more issue about transparency in, in, in AI anymore. Um, and um, of course, that sounds too good to be true. And of course, if it was true, then we wouldn't have all these different kinds of interpretability methods, right? The reality is, each one is going to offer different pros and cons, um, different cool features, um, if you will. Right. Some might have more limitations than others. Some might be more general, et cetera. Right. Um, so one limitation of the minimal gradient method um, is that uh, you know we, we were able to visualize things, right? Um, but um, let me actually go back to the code. Oops. Um, if we actually like inspected, um, hold on. If we actually inspected like the values of here, dot numpy, right? We get like all this stuff. And, you know, one question you can ask is, well, how do I interpret these numbers, right? What do these mean, right? Um, and, you know, especially like if, if I look at another one, Oh man, these values look even bigger than the one before. Does bigger mean better? Like, how do I compare across different, you know, into really maps, right? Or is it relative to within the same map, right? Questions on how do we actually interpret these raw values emerge, right? And so that's definitely a valid concern. And um, if you wanted to add numerical interpretability, right? If you wanted to you know, be able to look at these numbers and say, oh, now they have meaning. Um, then we could use something called integrated gradient. And integrated gradient is basically vanilla gradient, except now we're integrating these vanilla gradient maps over a bunch of images, right? And when we integrate, basically we're taking an average. We're doing a sum and then we're dividing by basically the number of steps or multiplying by a very small infinitesimal. And so um, uh, instead of going into math, I'm going to focus on the intuition. So let me see if I could get a whiteboard. Uh, great. So basically, here we are in image space. Let me put in some text, image space. And say that we have our target image somewhere out here, and we'll call our target image x naught. All integrated gradients is saying is that we have some reference image out here called x prime. And typically, this reference image is something unimportant, like the all black pixel image. Right? So, oh my god, <laughs> imagine this is all black, right? And the idea is that f of x prime 
hopefully is approximately zero, although in practice I've seen that it's not really the case, but whatever. Um, hopefully this is you know un so unimportant that we just give it zero score. And all integrated gradients is saying we have some path in image space, you know, could be crazy, whatever, uh, from x prime to x naught. And for each image that we encounter in our path, you know, I'm only doing a sample of images, right? We have some interpolation between these two images, right? So maybe this is like a seven, and this is the all black image. Well, then maybe something in between is like sort of like a seven, but it's like still got elements of like the black stuff in it, and like, you know, kind of weird, right? And then maybe this looks a little bit more like the seven, and then maybe this is more like the black stuff, and this is maybe more similar, right? Um, but yeah, basically we're moving through this image space and we're saying, you know, for each of these images, we, we can get the VG map of this, right? VG of X naught or, you know, I of X naught, sorry, I VG of X naught, right? And then we can get the interval map for this one, interval map, blah, 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 right? You can get your interval map, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what we're saying is that let's average all of these interval maps over this path. Right, so let's take um, an arbitrary map, right? So for each of these, like, we basically combine them all into a single IG map, right? Into a map of IG, right? And this would be of your target image. But of course we know this with respect to some baseline image, right? And hopefully this should be like something like, you know, well, maybe not that clear, but you know, something that's like roughly sh seven shaped, right? Um, and so uh, in practice, this path is usually just a simple um, straight line path, right? So how would you mathematically describe a straight line path? You would just say like X prime plus some alpha times x naught minus x prime for alpha in zero to one, right? So this is an interpolation between two different images, right? And that's just a straight line path. You can see it's a linear function, right? Um, and so that, this basically describes your path parameterized by alpha. And from there, we can start to use this and then basically put this in integral and then evaluate our vanilla gradient at each sort of step, right? So why the heck would you ever do this, right? It seems very computationally intensive. Like, you know, instead of um, whatever the cost was for evaluating VG, now we do that times like, you know, a lot, right? To evaluate an integral over some path. Well, the advantage is that now you have a numerical interpretability, right? Because it turns out that if you look at each individual pixel in your integrated gradient map, right, and you sum them up, so IG sub I, the i pixel, overall I, it turns out that this actually equals the difference between your classification score for your target image and the classification score for your reference image. And you see here why we'd want this part to be zero, right? Um, so that we can sort of interpret this as like maybe being more of an absolute value. And so why is this cool? Well, you can say that if the difference is just the sum of the pixels in my integrated gradient map, then we know that each pixel's value sort of has like this one-to-one -one contribution to this difference here, right? And so you could say, oh, this integrated gradient value is like, you know, 5% of this difference. Or in other words, it accounts for like 5% of why um, we gave it the score for X naught, right? And so now you can interpret these scores as actually being, you know, how important they are numerically, right? Uh, and that is called the completeness axiom, which you can find more about in the paper. 
And um, you might also recognize that actually this is basically the fundamental theorem of calculus, but those are details you can you know, look at later after this workshop. Um, so, okay, that's cool. So we have integrated gradients. It's an integration over some path of our vanilla gradient methods, and it gives us numerical integrability. Um, it also gives you better looking, arguably, uh, integrability maps, which we'll see in a bit. Um, but how do you actually evaluate this in your practice, right? Like, you can't just give, you know, Python an integral and say, you know, evaluate this, right? Uh, what, because obviously, you know, you have like infinite amount of values to evaluate along the path, right? So, as you might have learned in, in calculus, wherever you took it, um, there's a way to evaluate integrals or an approximation of integrals uh, called the Riemann sum or Riemann approximation. Um, and basically, your integral is just your Riemann sum taken to, you know, limit to infinity, right? Um, but in practice, we can't do infinite stuff in, in computers, so we just take it to some intermediate value. Um, so here's like the Riemann approximation for integrated gradients. Um, and S is the number of approximation steps. So you can remember like, again, back in high school calculus or wherever you learn calculus, uh, you could split your area into these equally sized, you know, um, strips, right, and then sort of sum these areas. Um, and so S is sort of like the number of, of strips that you're taking. Uh, and N is just a strip number. So like, you know, step number one, number two, number three, et cetera, up to S. And so, yeah, basically we're, so you can roughly interpret this as saying, okay, we're taking the vanilla gradient map and we're evaluating it at each step in our path. And we're just summing that up, right? You know, divided by s, right, which is roughly going to give you some average, and this is just sort of a normalizing constant that you'll get when you evaluate um, the integral. Um, it is technically a line integral, um, but again, that's not too important. Um, so, um, sorry, that slide was too early, um, but yeah, that, <laughs> that's basically the last. Uh, slide I had. So let's actually implement integrated gradients. And uh, this actually turns out to be, it's a little bit more involved, but it's pretty straightforward. We can do this by the end of time. Um, especially now that we have our useful function VG maps, right? We can just directly call that along each step in the path, right? So let's do that. Um, so yeah, I'm, so I'm going to define another function called get IG maps. And this is going to take in the images as before, but we also need our number of steps in our approximation, right? In our resolution. So I'm just gonna, for clarity, say S is the number of approximation steps, right? <clears throat> and um, yeah, our goal is to return the IG map for some images, where images is the images to find the map for. So, okay. So first thing we need to do is we need to convert our images to TensorFlow tensor, right? As we did before. So I'm just gonna pass this into TF constants. And um, this time, since we're gonna do operations on the image, I'm gonna make sure explicitly that it's a floating point um, value that it's being interpreted as. We also need to find our baseline images. So we're just gonna set those to be the all black images or just the zero image, right? And it's gonna have the same shape as our images. And I'm also gonna make sure it's a floating point. And um, as you remember, there's a difference. There's this normalizing constant in front, which is just the difference between the two. So I'm just going to say, okay, let's subtract those two. Let's subtract images. And baseline. Um, let's see what else can we define. Okay, there's this like other constant here, which is one divided by like your number of steps. So I'm just gonna say div equals tf dot divide. Um, sorry, just do tf constant one dot s. <laughs> and then uh, since we're also gonna use s later on, I'm just gonna make this a TensorFlow constant. 
Okay. And so now we're actually going to do the sort of loop that's going to get us to our approximation. So I'm going to define a helper function called approximation step. And it's going to take in our current step number as well as our accumulated result, which is basically our current sum. So basically, this computes one step in the approximation, where n is the step number, and the result is your current current sum. Right. Okay. And so let's see what else we can define. Okay, so obviously we're going to need to get the interpolated image. So uh, let's first get this n divided by s thing. So we're going to say n underscore s is just, oops. <clears throat> we'll divide. Um, so I'm going to cast these two uh, floating points just to be safe. Um, so I'll have like n and then um, tf dot float 32. And stf dot float 32. Okay. And then our interpolated images is just going to be adding the baseline with you know our alpha, which is in the approximation just n over s times the difference. And now we can get the VG maps of our interpolate interpolated images. And we could just call our get VG maps function here. Interpolated images. <clears throat> and so our step result is just going to be multiplying our normalizing constant. So we're going to multiply dip times um, this vanilla gradient times this other constant here. Right. So we're going to multiply um our vg maps by n over s um uh sorry not n over s div because we already defined it here <laughs> okay and then what we're going to return is sort of like the next step right so we're going to increment um n by one and we're going to use this in a while loop, so it's going to make sense why we do this later on. Uh, and we just add our step result to our current result, so it's an accumulated result. Okay. So now we actually do our, our while loop, and in TensorFlow, you can just use tf while loop. So these are just matching these two things, and we only care about the result and the final result. So we say tf while loop. And so the first thing in our while loop is our condition. So it takes in our parameters, which is just n and the result, but we don't care about our result for our condition. And we just want to make sure this is less than or equal to the number of steps, right? So our current step number is equal to num less than or equal to the number of steps. And um, for each loop in our body, we just do run approximation step. And um, here is sort of like the initial values. So our, our step number one is just one. and our starting accumulated result is just zeros, right? Just zero. So we're just going to do, um, you know, zeros with the same shape of these images. And I'm going to make sure this is a floating point, right? And then finally, we just return result because this gives us our final accumulated result. Okay. And then basically, we can now test, hopefully, if everything works. Uh, we can test on maybe like the first five images again. And for our approximation steps, we'll just say like 20. I don't want to take too long. Baseline is not defined. Let's see. Oh, baseline. OK. Um, baselines. Where is that? Do you have subtract? Right, okay. Bingo. All right. Hopefully this works. And then let's let's actually visualize some of these images. So plot that I am show. IG maps zero. C map equals 
blue white and red. Please work. See, I don't know why it's not. <clears throat> okay. There we go. Okay. Bingo, right? It looks more like a seven compared to our um, our other one here, where we just said like, right? So it looks more like a seven, which is good. IG, um, and even in the paper, they claimed like, um, let's see. Yeah, they claimed like, uh, notice that uh, integrated grains is better than uh, vanilla gradients, which is on the right column. So that's good. Um, one other thing we could test is the completeness axiom, and that's basically the last thing we'll do. So we want to make sure that the difference in the logits is equal to the sum of the IG maps. And let's see if that's true. So we could say like, um, let's see. So we have our target image. So let's say X test our, just the first one. And then we'll index into, so predicted seven. And then we'll subtract, um, We'll subtract these zeros. So np dot zeros. And then I'll just take the same shape as this. <clears throat> um, and then we'll say this dot numpy is 11. And then we'll just sum the values in here. tf dot, um, actually, we just use mp dot sum. IG maps. Yeah, and so the sum of the values is very close to the difference, right? So we verified numerical integrability works as well. Um, and so hurry, yeah, we've uh, we've implemented this, and you can see like um, we could do this for other numbers too, and you know they all look pretty good. So um, that's it. That's pretty much you've integrated your gradients, and you've got your second method here. Um, and yeah, that's our workshop. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know now. Um, otherwise, thanks for coming. And um, yeah, if you ever want, uh, I'll post the slides too on Discord after this. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to DM me if, if any of the stuff on the slides that you look at later doesn't make sense or you want to chat about any of the things we covered. Uh, I have a quick question. Do you mind going back to the paper? All right, everyone. Thanks for coming. Oh, can you hear? Can you hear me? I'm gonna stop sharing now. Oh, yeah. What's up? Is my audio off? Um, most likely. Someone was asked, oh, shoot. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, I think I'm having audio problems right now. So sorry about that. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful. Will the code recording be uploaded somewhere later? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll share the notebook that I just did and then also share the recording shortly after this meeting. Um, looks like I've lost my Zoom options. <laughs> Can you go back to the paper that has the original images and the salient maps? Sure. Um, hold on, let me share my screen again. Hmm. Oh, there are my options. Let's see. Share computer sound. Um, Let's see, did you want, hold on. 
Um, which paper, this paper or this one? The vanilla gradient one or the integrated gradient? Um, the vanilla gradient one, it looks like this one. The first one? Okay, great. So, for example, in the monkey image, the saliency map displays the general gesture of the monkey. Um, so this one? See, that's the only monkey image here. If we have a person with the same gesture at the same position, does it give us a similar saliency map? <laughs> so, um, I think that's a reasonable expectation just from like a human perspective. But you have to also keep in mind that each sailing map is with respect to a certain class, right? And so in, in the footnote here or the figure caption, they say top one per day class, right? Which is what we looked at today. It's basically your highest score. So this would probably be like what? Like the monkey class, right? And you would get the map from here. If you had a person in the same, you know, the same gesture, the same position, um then you would have to take it with respect to you know a person class right um but visually yeah you would hope that they would be roughly you know the same um but it sort of depends on the model um because that you know if the model is poorly trained then it can give you garbage results um yeah No problem. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, sorry if I didn't catch anyone like speaking up throughout the workshop. My audio is being really weird right now. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to ignore anyone. I just, you know, having technical difficulties. Uh, the saliency maps are only used for post hoc analysis, right? Yeah, so, so would there ever be a situation where vanilla is better? Um, I mean, one advantage of vanilla is that it's super simple, right? It's super efficient to compute, right? And, um, you know, there are occasions where, you know, vanilla gradient might suit you just fine if you need something quick and dirty. Um, and um, vanilla gradient also, if you look at the, um, if you look at some of these papers, it turns out that vanilla gradient is, does a really good job at being faithful to the model. So it sort of addresses Jeff Penton's concern that there might be some difference or it might be cooking up a story. It turns out that vanilla gradient is actually pretty, pretty truthful about what's going on in the model. Um, so that's sort of like one advantage compared to, um, I think integrated gradient is also faithful, but there are other methods that are, <laughs> that are more questionable. Um, so vanilla gradient is sort of like the old reliable, I think, of, of saliency maps. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, because I'm gonna have to fix my audio. But it's not good. <laughs> so it's likely if you're getting garbage with vanilla integrated or other me methods won't give you any better results. Um, actually, we saw the opposite, right? And when we, um, here, right? Like if you looked at the IG map, for like seven, right? It looks pretty much like a seven. Whereas when we looked at it here, it looks kind of harder to interpret, right? So quality does seem to improve with integrated gradients. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if you're getting garbage with one, then you know you might get something better or worse with with a different one. Um, but yeah, I think the the rule of thumb is that integrated gradients you're gonna get pretty nice looking, pretty nice looking uh, sailing maps. Okay, no problem.
Great. Any more questions? Okay, great. I'm going to let y'all go. Um, so thanks again for coming and um, good luck with finals, everyone.